This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Hey folks, I want to tell you about a great company that's doing a lot of good in the world. I'm so proud to have them as a sponsor. It's called Black Rifle Coffee Company. In 2014, Evan Hafer and Army Ranger Matt Best founded Black Rifle Coffee Company to combine two passions, developing premium roast-to-order coffee and supporting the veteran and military community. With the Buy a Bag, Give a Bag campaign, BRCC donated over 30,000 pounds of coffee to troops overseas in 2019, and they currently employ over 200 veterans. Visit blackriflecoffee.com slash kick and use promo code kick for 20% off your purchase. That's blackriflecoffee.com slash kick and promo code kick for 20% off. To our suffering, my dear. There's not enough scotch in the world for that. <laughs> Charlie, what are you writing now? A little novella. I'm calling none of your goddamn business. <laughs> well, you were invited to stay here for a few days until we can find a place. Shirley has these bouts. She's gone sick in the head. I read your story. What are you doing in here? It made me feel thrillingly horrible. What are you up to? That girl, what do you think? Tried and a bit trashy, but uh, yeah, give it a go. I feel like we're in the Scottish play. On the verge of madness. What will happen? What becomes of your dear heroine? What happens to all lost girls? That was a preview of a new film called Shirley, which explores the acerbic, sometimes toxic, but always complex marriage between famed horror writer Shirley Jackson and the acclaimed literary critic Stanley Heyman. It stars Elizabeth Moss as Jackson and Michael Stuhlbarg as her philandering husband. And today, Michael Stuhlbarg joins me on the podcast to talk about that complicated relationship how Stanley Heyman influenced Shirley Jackson's work, and how the filmmakers of Shirley imbued the movie with a distinctively Jackson-esque style. Michael talks about his prolific career on stage and screen, from training in mime with Marcel Marceau, to working with directors like the Coen brothers and Guillermo del Toro. Then he discusses the actors who inspired him as a kid, how he decides on his next project, and the different experiences of working as a character actor versus playing the lead. Coming up with Michael Stuhlbarg in just a moment. Today I'm talking with the brilliant actor Michael Stuhlbarg. You know him from Boardwalk Empire and Fargo and movies like A Serious Man, Lincoln, The Post, Trumbo, and The Shape of Water, just to name a few. Now he stars as the husband of horror writer Shirley Jackson in Shirley, which comes out on Hulu, Video on Demand, and participating drive-ins June 5th. Michael Stuhlbarg, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. Nice to meet you. Well, Michael, I have been a fan of your work for years, and you are one of a very small handful of actors who I can rely on as a heuristic of sorts for whether a movie's just going to be great. Um, <laughs> you're a hallmark of quality, I have to say. And well, thanks. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we just have the same taste in movies and TV. But Maybe, maybe so. Yeah, what do you look for when you're trying to decide on a project? Oh, geez. Um, I have very little uh, choice about the kind of stuff that comes my way. I just try to make the best decisions based on what does come, you know? Mm -hmm. So it could be something that makes me laugh or think or moves me or something I've never done before and never thought of myself uh, to, to do. Uh, there's a great variety of things that could, for some reason or another, tickle me into wanting to participate, but um, I'm always grateful to have opportunities. 
Well, you certainly do seem to have discriminating taste when it comes to the projects that you oh, do. Thanks. I meant what I said. When I, I see your name in the cast of a movie, it's a sure bet that it's going to be a good film. And so thanks, far, man. you've never let me down, including this latest film, Shirley. Thank you. Now, I want to ask you to take us back to your early years starting out in the business, or let's go back even farther than that to when you were a kid growing up in, I think, Long Beach. Uh, who were some of the directors and actors who you admired or maybe inspired you to get into acting? Um, I don't know about get into the business, but I admired, uh, there were, you know, my staples were, you know, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, uh, uh, Meryl Streep, Anthony Hopkins, Derek Jacoby. These were people who bowled me over with what they could do, how they did what they did, their sense of humor, their passion, their, their, um, their gifts were extraordinary, particularly to me. Al Pacino, uh, those were people who, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, those were all people I admired uh, greatly and hoped that if I continued doing what I was doing, that I might get a chance to work with some of them. And uh, that's been a, a, a fantastic uh, element of the road that I've been on and getting to meet some of them and, and work with some of them. Um, uh, also, directors would probably the most... Um, those who had uh, the most, um, how would I put this, I guess, profound effect on me as a young person was most likely Stanley Kubrick and Bob Fosse and Martin Scorsese. Those three guys uh, in particular made films that I was so sort of hypnotized by and would always watch when I had the chance to watch them, each for their respective gifts. I loved Mr. Fosse's theatricality and how he saw certain things, particularly his film Cabaret. And with mm -hmm. um, Mr. Kubrick, it was, gosh, uh, and, and you, Clockwork you started Orange, in Cabaret I guess. on Broadway, I think, too, right? Pardon me? Uh, you starred in Cabaret on Broadway, too, right? I was. I was in Sam Mendes' yeah. production of Cabaret yeah. back in 1999 oh, for about six months. Yeah. I was uh, yeah. it took over for Dennis O'Hare in the role of Ernst Ludwig in that story. Yeah. It's a world I love, and um, I was so, so honored to have been a part of that, to mm -hmm. get to know Sam a little bit and to get to know Mr. Kander as well um, yeah. and to work with that remarkable yeah. group of folks. Um, well, Michael, I have to say... You have such a wonderful demeanor, both on screen and off. You are so understated and gentlemanly. And so many of your roles exude this brilliant soft-spokenness in the same way that Pacino as a young Corleone epitomized the quiet exercise of power. Where does that come from? Were you a soft-spoken kid? Were you shy? It's funny. I never thought of myself as being terribly soft-spoken. It's sort of like, from my perspective, I, I am me. <laughs> I, I talk this way. And, you know, I, in some ways, I feel like I'm a loudmouth in, in a lot of ways. Maybe it's just how I've been utilized or what the projects were that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just uh, my particular chemistry of where, you know, my parents were from and how I generally want to be in the world or how I am. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I like to remain open to the world. I like to listen and, uh, I guess connecting to people, I guess there's always a sense of respect about wanting to interact mm -hmm. with people. And generally I find it's best to do that in as gentle a, a manner mm -hmm. <laughs> as possible, I guess. That's a stab at the, yeah. Yeah. Good advice for acting in life. <laughs> it's an aspect I never really uh, uh, honestly honored as much as I should really? have in my, in my <laughs> real life uh, or in my training to do what I do. They're often, you know, in the theater, for instance, people are telling you about, you know, being able to fill up a space so everybody can mm -hmm. hear you if it's a, you know, a, a large space, 2000 seats or whatever it is. So there's always an element to try to be able to fill large spaces with your presence or with your voice. Mm -hmm. However, uh, with film and television, it's, it's the opposite. It's almost as if right. you want to provide a change of thought and that's as loud as it needs to be in some cases. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of soft spokenness, I, I read that you actually trained with the mime Marcel Marceau <laughs> early in your career. What was that like? I don't know really if you could say I trained with him, but I did. I spent a summer program, 
uh, I want a scholarship to, to meet him, to study with him, to learn uh, about the physical discipline that was telling stories without language. Um, and it was a fascinating summer. Uh, and uh, he spoke all summer long. He was quite loud, in fact. <laughs> really? Uh, and a great, great inspiring figure. Uh, and, a, and a gentleman and, and funny and um, I learned I, I did not have that kind of discipline or didn't really wish to pursue that kind of work as much as I preferred um, doing other things. I wonder, are there things that you picked up in mime that have made you a better actor? You know, it's funny. If you watch anyone who's good at what they do, particularly in any art that is a physical art, they have mastery over their whole body. Mm -hmm. every element of how they could express themselves. So I wouldn't be surprised if having a great awareness of what your instrument can do uh, serves anybody, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what those folks were studying. That's what I tried to open my mind to. And it was amazing to watch people tell stories without language completely with their body. Uh, it just wasn't where my heart yeah. was. Well, and not many people other than Marcel Marceau can make a decent living in mime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say this. I can certainly see the influence of mime in your acting because you are a master of subtle expression. You're one of those actors who can say more with one raised eyebrow <laughs> than most actors can say in a whole page of dialogue. Oh, thank you. Now, I guess you had been working in theater for years, but your big break in film was, of course, the Coen Brothers, A Serious Man. I, I just love that movie. It, oh, it's such a great expression of what the Coen Brothers are. I think so. Oh. It really is kind of a, uh, a crucible of yeah. uh, where they came from. Um, I was loosely based on their father, who was a professor uh, at oh. the University of Minnesota. I didn't know that. Uh, it was shot close to, I think, where they must have grown up. It would be shot it in, in Minneapolis. And, uh, and um, their sensibility was formed there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, an opportunity to sort of get a, a glimpse into a little bit of what their life was like. Well, what's it like being on the set with those guys? Are they serious? Are they quirky and offbeat like their movies? Are they collaborative? Soft-spoken. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> no, that was a joke. Well, they're that too. Um, they're, you know, they are very Zen as you'd probably imagine them to be. They have a great yeah. sense of humor. Their, uh, humor is very dry, but they have great big hearts and are love to laugh. And we're very generous with someone who had never really spent a lot of time in front of the camera. Uh, but they felt that was right for the role and they had seen me in plays in New York, uh, and had been generous to me in the past. And it just seemed a good kind of marriage of a person at his at the time in, in my life that I was at that time and a role that came along and uh, they gave me a shot and I, I ran with it. And um, they were very generous, good guys, really, really good guys. And I'd love to work with yeah. them again someday on, on some other vision that they have. Right. They're constantly reinventing who they are and they're fascinated with all different kinds of worlds. So uh, right. I, had, I have great admiration for them and great love. Right. Well, you did the series Fargo, but they're, they're not directly involved with that anymore, right? They are, are um, executive producers on the show, but right. have uh, really just sort of said to Noah, take it and run with it, do what you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways they are wonderfully generous in terms of how what they think of creating art and uh, they're basically wash their hands of it once they offer it up to the world and so people can do with it what they want they simply signed on i think to um just give him a thumbs up and he took it and ran with it and it's been great fun and a world that everybody's been really uh enjoying being a part of oh, yeah. for those who've been a part of it and i had a great experience working on it. Yeah. Um, He's done an amazing job of creating something a little bit different from the film, but still it keeps the spirit of the film. Absolutely. And I haven't seen the new season yet, but yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new season too. Yeah. And listeners will also remember you from Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water, of course. Uh, he must be great to work with. He just seems like a big, soulful, creative teddy bear. And, and I think he wrote much. that part for you, right? Well, uh, gosh. If he did, it was pretty prescient on his part because I, uh, some of the things that he 
in, uh, that he created within that guy. Uh, he, I don't think he could have known about me, for instance, that I had, mm. I don't know, taken Russian as a language in college. I don't think oh, really? he knew that going into it. So it was kind of a kind of kismet in some ways, but uh, he's very, very perceptive. And one of the most, um, gosh, inspiring artistic um, individuals I've ever, ever come across. He has his thumbprint on every element in the film, whether it's what color is being used and um, what the biography of each of the characters is. And yes, he was, he created biographies for all of us and gave us backstories wow. going into it. That's huh. never happened to me before. Yeah. Um, but he's, yeah, not he's, on a movie, maybe on a TV series, but not on a film. No, and it's <laughs> r- remarkable. He's so yeah. much fun. Yeah. I had a wonderful time collaborating with him. And before we get to your latest project, I just want to tell you, I, I was such a big fan of Boardwalk Empire and you oh, were so great as Thanks. Arnold Rothstein, someone that most people have no idea even existed. Yeah. And, and to this day, literally probably my all time favorite monologue is the one where you use gambling as a metaphor for when to kind of keep your powder dry and wait for the right moment to strike. I, I say you should have gotten an Emmy for that scene alone. <laughs> Thanks. It was an amazing time in my life. Yeah. And, and Arnold Rothstein's one of those people that few people even know today, but he, he fixed the 1919 World Series. And I guess if they know anything, he inspired the character of Meyer Wolfsheim and Gatsby. Right. And I've read that you did a lot of research for that role, deep research, in fact, so much that the producers of Boardwalk sort of treated you like something of a, a historical consultant. They would come to you to fact check <laughs> them, huh? Well, I do take researching uh, very seriously and I do try yeah. to learn as much as I can to offer as much as I can back. Uh, and they let me do that. And I was grateful for the opportunity. And if, mm. yeah, if I saw any discrepancies, I could reveal whatever research I was able to come across. They have so many things yeah. to keep straight that uh, sure. I was just trying to be of help, honestly. Did you ever get on their nerves fact-checking them like, whoa, 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 he, he wouldn't have worn a tab collar. <laughs> he, Arnold Rothstein wore a detachable collar, something like that. No, I never really <laughs> forced it on them, but I okay. would, when given a scene, sort of say, well, this is what I know historically. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm glad to do whatever you want to do. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll return with more when we come back in just a moment. Maybe you've been thinking about how you can make a greater impact in your profession or in the world. And the world needs leaders like you, especially now, given these unprecedented challenges. When you're ready to take the next step in your career... Capella University can help. They've created flexible doctoral programs that work with your schedule and can help you put your passion into action. Wondering where to start? What it's like to be a doctoral student or what it takes to find success with online learning? Capella has designed online doctoral degree programs to help you gain the experience and skills you need to lead in your career and impact the world around you. Their courses, curriculum, and learning formats are all created with flexibility in mind to fit your life and your schedule. The world needs leaders like you. When you're ready, Capella is here to help you take the next step. Learn more by exploring available programs and scholarship opportunities at capella.edu slash doctoral. That's C-A-P-E-L-L-A dot E-D-U slash doctoral. You have played so many historical figures over the years. Uh, George Yeoman in Lincoln, Abe Rosenthal in The Post, Edward G. Robinson, Lou Wasserman, and now this latest movie. Do you always do that kind of deep dive into a person when you play a real figure? Uh, As much as I can, depending Mm -hmm. upon how much time I have to do research. I think it just, it serves everybody for me to know as much about, you know, my story behind the scenes as possible, mm-hmm. whether we it's used or not is a whole other, you know, kettle of fish, but, uh, uh, that's okay because yeah. it grounds me in the best possible way to mm-hmm. at least provide what I think is a viable, uh, perspective on who these people mm-hmm. were. So you're not one of those actors who wants to come to it as sort of a blank slate and no preconceived notions about a character, huh? 
Well, I guess it depends on the circumstance because if mm-hmm. it's a fiction, you know, I've got to, even in those instances, uh, it, it serves me, I think, to create a backstory mm-hmm. uh, or in the case of playing someone who really lived to know as much about them as you can. And then on the day, you show up as blank of a slate as you can, knowing yeah. what you know. Yeah. And in your latest film, you played the husband of famous Gothic writer Shirley Jackson, played by the brilliant Elizabeth Moss. Yeah. Had you read much of Shirley Jackson's work before making this movie? No, not a bit of it. Uh, um, I'd known some titles of hers, but I had never made it uh, uh, to reading them. Or uh, in some cases, I think there had been a film at that time made of The Haunting of Hill House, among other films that have recently uh, had a kind of renaissance. Uh, her 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 material is is being, uh, I think, optioned all over the place, which is wonderful. Uh, it's a a new a brand new world for people to learn about, which is terrific. But no, I didn't know anything about her. Did you read any of her work once you got the role in this? Yeah, movie? absolutely. I I really did another deep dive in this occasion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I thought we were playing the real people, and then I soon found out that. Our screenplay was loosely based on a novel that was also fiction. Uh, So it was almost like, I guess you could say, twice removed from the truth, at least. Um, And we create a premise and use it as a jumping off point Mm -hmm. of Shirley and Stanley um, hosting a young uh, professor at their home in Bennington, Vermont. Uh, And uh, what happens when... Shirley, in particular, has written a very famous short story called The Lottery and uh, becomes instantly uh, uh, an overnight sensation and doesn't really know what to do with the notoriety. And it kind of, our story takes place in that middle period when she's trying to figure out what to do next after Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, benefit of attention, but the unwelcome uh, aspect of it as well. People know Shirley Jackson as the author of The Lottery, as you mentioned, and The Hangsman, The Bird's Nest, The Haunting of Hill House, Mm -hmm. uh, a number of great literary works of the 20th century. And she's come to eclipse her husband, Stanley Hyman, but he was quite well known in his day as well. Tell us a little about him. Within his circle, yes, absolutely. A very well-known and respected literary critic. Yeah, and also a jazz critic, right? Yes. Uh, Yeah, he was funny in that he was a literary critic who was very vocally critical of literary criticism. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. <laughs> he was the literary critic of literary critics. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. From what I know about him, he was a bit of a rebel in the realm of literary criticism. If rebels exist in that field, uh, he overturned many of the accepted critical methods of his day and created his own style of critical theory that I guess is still widely referred to today. Yeah, I think from what I remember about it, he gave himself very strict uh, um, guidelines in terms of what he thought criticism was, and he adhered to those. And he was also pretty influential in music circles. He was a big jazz critic, and we actually get to see that in the film with some of the records that he selects to play at home and in his class. Absolutely. He has a huge fascination with music, uh, American music, as well as jazz music and the history of that. And there are are elements of that that are reflected in the film as well. He wasn't really an author himself, per se, but as a critic, he seems to have had a keen eye for great fiction. How much impact do you think that he had on Shirley Jackson's writing? I think a profound impact. I think they were they chose the life that they created together. And I think they were passionate about their respective arts. And I think he was essential to Shirley in that he would read everything she wrote before it was published. He would give her his two cents about what he felt she created. And I think he became um, uh, essential to her process of making what she made. Mm -hmm. That said... Uh, I think he had a huge appreciation for her gift and could not do what she did. So I think he was as in awe of her as she may have perhaps reflected back at him. So they had a great sense of having that or being that for each other, Mm -hmm. Uh, a soundboard. And um, I don't know, they're kind of, you know, two peas in a pod, I suppose, or dependent upon each other. 
I really enjoy the complexity of Stanley and Shirley's marriage because it's funny on one level, it's easy to say that it's a volatile and codependent relationship. I mean, what could be more toxic match than an author and a literary critic? Right. But, but in a weird way, they also seem to really get each other in an almost telepathic way. Absolutely. What do you make of that relationship? Absolutely. I think that's, uh, that is part of the magic, I think, is that there was so much water under the bridge in terms of their history at that point in their lives, or at least where we thought we were playing it from. Uh, that they could read each other's thoughts, could answer each other, you know, could uh, 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 end each other's sentences and um, were two halves of a brain, perhaps, <laughs> the critical half and the artistic half. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a wonderful thing to uh, mine in terms of uh, the physical life or how we could man manifest that uh, or sh show that physically one way or mm -hmm. another. Really fun. Really, really fun. Oh, yeah. And it's a very interesting power dynamic between those two because I guess they met when he was her professor at Syracuse and she was a student. And yet he's also somewhat of a slave to her in the sense that, at least as he explains it, his job is to keep her alive <laughs> and to keep <laughs> well, her writing. I, yeah, well, in some ways, I think she she was suffering through all kinds of things. Um, mm. And I think he understood that and I think he wanted to help in the best ways he could to perhaps shake the dust off to uh, bring her back to life when she became um, paralyzed somewhat mm -hmm. uh, with fear uh, about what was happening in her life, about her agoraphobia, not wanting to leave the house. And he tried to, I think, serve her by, I don't know, putting a fire under her somehow or another, provoking her to get up and, 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 and find her way. I think they relied upon each other for that. I think, I think he was better because she was in his life. I don't know if she was better because he was in her life, but <laughs> I don't know. The boundaries were well known and understood in terms of, for, for instance, his infidelity. She knew about it. He told her about it and she accepted it for what it was and didn't apparently, uh, uh, it was an accepted part of their relationship, but um, they knew what they were getting with each other, I think. And I yeah. think he could help her achieve what perhaps she had doubt she could do, or at least he could help her by believing in her as much as he did. And there is sort of a diabolical aspect to their relationship in that they both have this keen understanding of human psychology and how to wield that as a weapon. They take a perverse pleasure in sort of pushing people's buttons. Mm. And in that respect, the film kind of reminds me a lot of a Shirley Jackson book. Yeah. There's this real sense of psychological torture and that turning of the screw. I wonder, was that part of the idea to infuse the film with some elements of Jackson's writing? Absolutely. I think really? that was one of the entrance points for, ja uh, for Josephine uh, 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 in terms of in imbuing the experience of watching the film as if you were inside one of Shirley's stories in some way. Uh, very much so. Her her visual language is very dream-like. And it was an interesting yeah. experiment to combine a very literary, verbal, highly verbal text with a very uh, poetic, dream-like visual vocabulary. And I think that was part of what the fun was of the marriage of those two things mm -hmm. uh, in telling the story. I think she wanted very much to for people to to have that experience, that you weren't just meeting the real people. You were putting the real people in one of their stories. Yeah, there's a lot of Jackson-esque elements in the movie, especially the way that it gets into the minds of the characters and moves so fluidly between reality and imagination. And the other thing that I thought when watching Shirley is it reminds me a lot of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, particularly in the frustrated relationship between Stanley and Shirley and how they draw this unsuspecting younger couple into their world. Do you know yes. if that was a big influence as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Susan Merrill's book uh, that our screenplay was taken from uh, was deeply steeped in that idea. Mm -hmm. And I think we tried to take it even a little bit further if we could 
uh, but you sort of have that iconic foursome of the older mm. couple on an East Coast, in a, you know, a small East Coast university, and the younger professor who comes, uh, and um, and the muscles uh, and the dynamics that get exercised in the process of the four of them bantering with each other in such close proximity. And in this case for over a year, whereas that play takes place only in a night. And by the way, I love the locations for the movie. Was this actually shot where the real Shirley Jackson lived in Vermont? We, uh, uh, the action takes place there, but we shot it in upstate New York in the Hudson oh, Valley really? as well as at Vassar college. Oh, well, now I feel sort of silly because I, I was watching the movie and everything looked so beautiful that I started Googling real estate in Bennington, Vermont. But I guess I should have been looking at houses in the Hudson Valley. Oh, well, it was as evocative of that place as we could make it, given our yeah. our our, uh, our yeah. limited budget and, and circumstances. Well, it was perfect, too, because the locations for the film were very reminiscent of the settings in many of Shirley Jackson's stories. You know, the idyllic small town that hides something dark beneath the surface. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also have to give kudos to Elizabeth Moss, who is wonderful as Shirley Jackson. Was she fun to work with? Absolutely. As fun as you'd imagine. She's mm -hmm. she's a light. She's a bright, bright light in this world. And she was really playful and and terrifically collaborative and a great, great person. And I look forward to getting to do more press with her <laughs> over the next day. Well, you've been the lead in films like A Serious Man, but in large part, you've made your career as a character actor. And I don't mean that derisively in any way. Most of my favorite actors are character actors, guys like Stanley Tucci and Michael Shannon. I wonder, are you finding it gratifying to play larger roles in a film like Shirley? Because I imagine it must be difficult when you have a supporting role and you sort of parachute onto set with a handful of pages and only a few scenes to build a character. <laughs> and you might you might not have the rapport because they've been shooting for weeks and sure. here you are the new guy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, it's a whole different challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's sort of like you have to take each job for what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, um, yeah, in some ways it's like you have to step up and hit a home run, uh, mm. uh, given whatever the opportunities are. Whereas if you are present for the film or on camera, uh, for a lot of it, in some ways you get to watch the events unfold and perhaps can choose your moments in a mm. much m more, um, uh, with, a, with a little bit of a, a, a greater sense of, of what the, a longer arc would be as opposed sure. to coming in and sure. making a point. Sure. Um, both are challenging and both are, are, um, are, um, have been, have been uh, wonderful uh, to try yeah. to do. When you're considering doing a movie, does that factor into it? Do you seek out larger roles over supporting roles or is it just entirely about the character regardless of the size? You kind of take everything into your purview and you sort of feel, can I add anything to this? Can I, mm -hmm. can I uh, offer what they're, I think they're looking for? Uh, what would be really fun to do? Um, how much time do I have to prepare for what they're asking me to do? Uh, oh, interesting. Um, all of those things go into making choices about things or would I be repeating myself? Can I, mm. can I, can I use this as an opportunity to explore something I've never done before or open people's eyes about what my capabilities are. Uh, mm -hmm. All of those things are going into my thoughts about w what, what uh, opportunities have to offer. Mm -hmm. You make the best cho uh, choices yeah. you can and, and put your heart into it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it works. Well, before we go real quickly, what's up next for you? Do you have anything in the can before the coronavirus hit? <laughs> yes and no. Um, in some ways it kind of interrupted something I was shooting. I'm in new Orleans right now and I'm, uh, oh have been isolated here uh, or, you know, what do they say? Um, quarantining in place or whatever mm -hmm. the term is. Um, I'm here. I was making a new show, a series for Showtime called Your Honor with Brian Cranston and Peter, um, Peter Moffat and um, oh. Ed Berker and Carmen Ajogo and Hope Davis and Amy Landecker and Isaiah wow. Whitlock, a wonderful group of actors. Yeah. Uh, and we got Great. about six or seven episodes in and then this happened. And so we we're on a hiatus until oh, uh, the unforeseen future uh, well, until we can safely get back to work again. Yeah. 
Um, but it's been a, a, a joy. Yeah, something to look forward to. Absolutely. Well, once more, in the meantime, Shirley is out on Hulu Video On Demand and participating drive-ins June 5th. Michael Stuhlbarg, thanks. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Nice to meet you, Ben. Thanks again to Michael Stuhlbarg for coming on the show. See Michael in Shirley, which is out on Hulu, Video On Demand, and participating drive-ins beginning June 5th. For more information, visit cornerstonefilm.com slash films slash Shirley. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and rate and review us while you're there. Five-star ratings and detailed reviews are one of the best ways for new listeners to discover the show. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at at KickAssNewsPod and recommend us to your friends on your social media. For more fun stuff, visit KickAssNews.com and I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickAssNews.com. For now, I'm Ben Mathis and thanks for listening to KickAss News.